Okay, our next session, uh, our next uh, keynote speaker for this session is Dr. Ken Yang. Um, Dr. Yang is the principal of the uh, Nouvelles Davis Yang and also TR uh, Hamza Yang in Malaysia. Dr. Yang is a very famous architect, recognized worldwide for his pioneering approach to ecological design and planning. Uh, Dr. Yang started his research into eco-architecture several decades ago when issues like biodiversity, sustainability, and also green building were not yet the hot topic for debate uh, in the circle of architects. Um, that's why I think, that's why Dr. Yang, Dr. Ken Yang considered himself to be an ecologi ecologist first and architect second, a statement I found in the website of his firm. Okay, I think uh, due to his contribution in this area in past years, he was named as one of the 50 people who could save the world um, by the Guardian in UK in 2008. I think this is a very high honor for an architect. Before that, I didn't aware that an architect can save the world, and Dr. Yang has made it. Okay, may I now in invite uh, Dr. Yang to come to the stage to give us a, uh, the keynote speech? I'm going to talk about the key ideas that drive our work on ecological design and master planning. And in many ways, what we do is very similar to what doctors and surgeons do with prosthesis. <laughs> now, here's a poor gentleman with prosthetic devices attached to his body. Artificial arm, artificial heart, artificial legs, and artificial kneecaps. Prosthetic device, as you know, is an artificial inorganic object which is human made and synthetic. And it has to be attached to a host organism, and in this case, it's a human body. Then everything depends on successful biointegration of the prosthetic device with the host organism. Otherwise, if it doesn't, then neither the prosthetic device fails or breaks down or the host organisms affected. Now, in my early work, I saw an analogy of this with what we do as architects and designers. Our built environment, our buildings, like the one that you're in right now, is artificial, is human-made, is synthetic. So the question then is, what is this host organism that has to be connected to? That's very simple, it's the biosphere. It's organic. Uh, environment that we are in. And so everything depends on successful biointegration. And it's this failure in, bio, in successful biointegration that's the cause of all of our environmental problems. To me, I see biointegration at three levels. Physical means connecting one to the other, like a prosthetic device, an artificial leg could be just connected to it. Systemic, which is something that a lot of doctors are trying to do now, is try and connect the prosthetic device to the nervous system so the brain can give instructions to a prosthetic device to operate. And for me, temporal means you know, the integration over time and the use of resources. So our early work starts to look at physical biointegration. And the physical integration with the ecological systems in nature. Now, ecologists sees the biosphere as consisting of units called ecosystems and ecosystems are communities of plants and animals and a physical environment, or as defined by ecologists, it's the biotic constituents and the abiotic constituents acting together to form a whole. It's this holistic property that differentiates an organism from a machine. Now then with this, we as human beings, although we're part of nature, it's unique, we are special, we are immensely powerful, we're able to change in landscapes, we need to change uh, uh, climate. You use inputs of, of energy resources and fossil fuels, and we emit rubbish and things into the air. And so this was happening. This is the disruption of natural systems, but a callous uh, biointegration between what we do and the, and, the, and, the, and the natural environment. And then it occurred to me that our built environment today, like this room that you're in, 
It's just physical. The only consti organic constituents is dreaming and the bugs. And so our early work is to see how we can bring these two together holistically. So an early diagram I did was to put all the biotic constituents in one location, as you can see in Central Park in New York or in the bottom diagram. You can have a patchy relationship in, in terms of planning. It's like George in London, receives the Green Squares, Bedford Square, Euston Square, Tavistock Square, Russell Square. Or you can see a patchy intermixing relationship in the diagram below. You can have a stepping stone relationship but the ideal is the last one, which is the continuous one, because in nature, everything's connected. It's the ecological nexus that makes nature what it is today. And so the answer is to really to have design buildings and connect the two um, through ecological corridors and fingers or through a much more integrating um, pattern. My early work starts to look at um, the intermixing, and this is a building we did. 34-story building. You can see the vegetation on the outside. And um, it's not a totally su successful um, experiment. But this image is emblematic for me of what an ecological architecture should look like. Nothing like what you've seen before in the past, nothing what you see in Hong Kong, nothing that you see in any city in the world. It has to be looking like a living system. So in this way, then we have a true integration of what we do with the living with the natural environment. So this the building was finished some time ago. You can see a series of green squares on the outside of the building. And now certain species in nature, like insects, birds and um, flying species, can move from one patch to another patch without being connected. But terrestrial species cannot. So I was looking into the ideal relationship, which is a spiraling relationship where all the uh, organic compound, all, all the vegetation and the landscape elements are connected. So this is for me. Uh, but I did an in-between design. This is one of the buildings we did for IBM. And we had a series of planters with a series of uh, trellises that connected up the building. The idea was to bring it up the building goes across the mid-level and up the other part of the building. So you can see it going up on one side, goes across the floor, and going up on the other side of the building to the top. This is a typical floor plate, and it, at that time I was also looking to the idea of the climate-responsive skyscraper and some of the principles on the left-hand side. And this is the uh, an extension of this building that I'm doing now. And here we try to use a green wall to try and bring it all the way up to the seat roof. The next is see whether we can have a much more continuous relationship. This is a building that we did in Hong Kong at the University of Hong Kong near the Queen Elizabeth um, building at the university. The idea then was to have a, a, to connect it to the green forest patch at the left hand side through a series of planters that goes all the way up to the top of the building. Then we'll start to look at green walls, the idea of, of attaching something to the wall. And you can see the green wall is, uh, part of it is that is behind it is the air conditioning fresh air intake so, the, so that the air is scrubbed by the vegetation before it enters the building. This is a telco company for a Swedish, this is a, a data center for a Swedish telco company. And, uh, at that time, my golden chalice was to was to see how I can achieve this continuous link relationship. This was a competition that we did in Singapore. Um, it wasn't built, but the idea was to have a continuous ramp that goes all the way up to the building. This is the model of it. And you can see it, it is continuous. But I later on, I thought it might be a good idea to put a walkway next to it. The walkway then becomes, uh, uh, if you like, a park that people can walk all the way up to the top of the building, a linear park, I call it. And the walkway can also use to service the planters. So it took me 10 years from the first time we had the idea to 2006 when this was eventually built. So you can see the walkway, you can see people walking up there. 
see if it's on the outside. The idea was to have a, uh, the ramp that climbs up one floor for every facade. So in this way, it works as we have to top the building. But where it hits the corner of the building, I call it placemaking, it opens up into a terrace. This is a view of the walkway again. And this is the typical terrace at the corner of the building. And terrace then becomes uh, like, a, like a square, equivalent to a square in the city, where people from the outside could you know, inter interact with the people on the inside. And this is one of the plazas, one of these squares at the corners of the building. This building is, was built in Singapore. At the middle level, I have green roofs. And then uh, similarly, at the top of the building, I have a green, green roof as well. The rating system in Singapore requires us to achieve a uh, vegetation index of six. We got 12.2, which is twice of what is required. So in many ways, the rating system for me is just a, an, a checklist that we need to exceed and go beyond. The building consists of basically two blocks connected by bridges. And here's a view of the bridge. You can see the two blocks on the left-hand side, A and B. And we did a number, of, we had other experiments in the building as well. We, this is the, what I call diagonal light shaft. We cut a shaft diagonally from the top of the building uh, all the way down. And you can see the diagonal light shaft is not rectangle on the right-hand side. And you know, this, well, you can't see this very well, but it's, the red square show how the shaft goes down the floor plate. And on top of the shaft, we open it out. And you can, you can get daylight entering it. And from the bottom, this is what it looks like looking up. So you can see the top of the light shaft. You can see the, the, uh, the skylight on top. And you can see life at the ground from the ground floor. So as you walk past the building, you're not at your face into a flat facade, but you have an articulated facade where you can look up and see your know, parts of the building. Then that's just integrating with the, uh, within the building and the vegetation. So next was to see how we can bring it all the way down to the basement. And we developed this idea of an eco cell where this is the floor plan of the ground floor, showing the vegetation going all, all the way down to the basement. And at the bottom, we can either have, oh, this was an earlier design that we did. Um, this was actually our competition entry for the Kowloon waterfront, um, which we, well, was a bit contro controversial, but uh, we, we won't talk about that. Um, so the eco cell brings vegetation all the way down to the basement of the building, which means the rainwater harvesting, natural ventilation, daylight. At the bottom, you can put a living machine for treating uh, black water, the sewage, or could a biosphere to bring w water back into the ground. And so this was the scheme. And for this scheme in Singapore, the eco cell is here. And, um, and so that's the bottom of the building. Now, at this point, you think, you know, all Ken does is just put veggies in buildings. Well, I can do that too. And so the next stage for us was to take it to the next level to see how we can achieve systemic integration. Now, this, this is a little bit more difficult. It requires a bit more effort. And what we try to do is to create habitats within the building. We look at habitats as places where different species can inhabit. And in many ways, um, it is part of the um, biointegration process. That's the scheme that we designed in Korea. And um, Gyeongji, which is about 37 degrees above the equator, is fairly fire diverse. As you can see, look at the histogram on the right-hand side. And this is the master plan for the scheme. And what we did was to locate parts of the site that we could convert into, we could make into habitats. And these habitats could be green roofs, green walls, green atriums, plazas, bridges, and so forth, undercrofts. And so you can see the master plan on the left hand side and all the habitats on the right hand side. And so um, here you are, here's a list of different habitats and where they're located in the master plan. So we put out habitats in, in a row, and uh, like ducks in the shooting gallery. And we look at, we, then we do research on a native fauna that we want to bring back to the site. Because the site's devastated, the biodiversity has been significantly reduced. And so then for having identified the fauna, we identified the flora that will attract the fauna. And with this, we prepare what we call the biodiversity matrix. And with this, then you can see how the habitats and the different species interact. And we designed this so that the species that are attracted by the flora, whether for refuge, feeding, or breeding. And then um, we try and, from here, this becomes a guide for us 
to design the actual landscape conditions for the species to survive over the four seasons of the year, spring, summer, autumn, winter. And so this is, if you like, the systemic integration, trying, trying to convert, make the building beyond just putting vegetation into it, integrating vegetation, and trying to make it into a living system. That's in a similar way, um, trying, a lot of doctors and surgeons trying to do now, which is trying to connect the prosthetic device into some sort of human command system so that the brain can tell the prosthetic device instructions on how to move. So this is the actual area view of the project itself. And a project near uh, Hong Kong is the one in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, this is the building that we're working on now in Kuala Lumpur, which is opposite Minister of Finance. And you can see the different habitats on the, in, in the building, in, in the top. And then this is the biodiversity matrix on the left-hand side. And that's the form of the building here, just under construction. And so the next level of green design uh, is to design buildings as living systems. That's what I call constructed ecosystems, and to set biodiversity targets. But as you can see, as in the same way that doctors and surgeons are still struggling to try and connect the, um, the organic system with the, uh, with the prosthetic device, the issues involved, I mean, if you have an artificial heart, if you put a battery in the, in, in the artificial heart, the heat of the battery affects the human body. And, you know, and to connect to the nervous system, there are issues of, of the body getting septic. So there, there is, is, we're still some way to achieve the, the ideal, uh, both in medi medicine and surgery and in ecological design. So here's a girl with, with a young lady with an uh, artificial arm. And so these are some of the issues that we have to address, which I still haven't resolved yet. So these were the green patterns that I started to look at when I, was, you know, when I started to, uh, in this field. These are other patterns that I'm working on now, and, um, and it becomes increasingly complex and green. Now, one of the things we have to do is to make nature whole again. Because we as human beings, when we go on, onto any part of the earth, we cut it up, we chop it up. We fragment it with roads, with drains, with sewer lines, with impervious surfaces. And nature is just the connectivity, the, the nexus in nature is, is lost. So this is, this is exactly what we've done. You know, so we need to reconnect nature to make nature whole again. So I mean, from the biome, and uh, we've cut it up, and so you know, nature then becomes separate, disparate pieces, and we've tried to reconnect it. And that, to me, is one of the objectives of what I'm trying to do in my work which is not just look at buildings by itself, but the buildings in this ecological context within the greater environment. And this is a, a master plan that we, we completed in Bangalore and uh, has a forest reserve on the right-hand side. We collect all the species by putting a spine there and we stretch it across the site. And so this is the master plan. You can see you know, the spine and we brought this across the site so that we can connect reconnect not just within the site, but the surrounding sites as well, so that the whole area, the whole district, whole precinct, and the whole region becomes connected. And that is the objective of what Green Design is about. And that's the master plan, that's the green infrastructure. Then we had a problem because we suddenly find that the green infrastructure is crisscrossed by roads. And so we had to find a solution for that how to enable this ecological connectivity and continuous vegetation and yet let a road go through. And so the answer was to have what we call the eco-bridge and eco-undercroft, where um, if you put a bridge, if A and B, as you can see on the left-hand side, are connected, are separated by this nasty highway, and if you connect it with a bridge and you vegetate it, then all of a sudden it improves ecological interactions between the species. You, have a, you change the ecological nature of the location, generates a larger pool of resources, to be shared between the species and encourages an increase in species diversity and then generates a much more stable ecosystem because by being, by being diverse, it requires less maintenance. So that's what the eco bridge looks like uh, from the bottom and from the, from the top. So for this scheme, the red squares show where the eco bridges are located. This is the eco bridge we designed in Guangzhou, where not only do we have an eco bridge, we also have a mass transit system that runs above it. So these are the eco bridges. You can see crossing the roads, you know, um, on the left hand side and on the right hand side. Now, 
The other thing we try to do is to see whether we can look at water. Because water is what organic life is about. Without water, none of us can survive. You know, when astronomers look into the skies, look in, into the planets, the first thing you look at is, is the presence of water. Because once there's water, then they know that planet has organic life. And so with water, we need to close the loop as much as possible through sustainable drainage and natural treatment of black water. And so um, this is a surface drainage scheme. This is my ideal concept for the net water, which is the close to water, so that within the built environment, we recycle and reuse the gray water, which is the water from the uh, sinks and, and showers. And then for the, for the black water, we treat it organically rather than through mechanical means. And so what, you know, for the water, we had a series of detention ponds to bring the water back into the ground to recharge the groundwater. And uh, this, is, this is the, what we call the constructed wetland, which is a natural way for treating black water without using mechanical means. What you have is a series of polishing ponds that goes from the right-hand side down to the left-hand side, so that by the time we reach the left-hand side, we can let it go back into the ground. So next is to try and have ecological corridors so we can weave the, you know, the uh, built environment with the natural environment. And this is a scheme we designed in the island east of Madagascar called the La Reunion, and it's 21 degrees above the equator. And, um, and now the site is that white rectangle, and you can see from the pattern, the natural patterns of vegetation right inside the series of vegetation lines, striations that go from the hill all the way down to the waterfront. And what human beings have done is that we have just developed the waterfront, scraped all the vegetation, and um, changed the landscape. So what we try to do is, in the pattern on the left-hand side, is to bring, is to collect all the species along the waterfront, and to bring it back in a series of equal sort of lines of striations back to meet the, the hills, so that then it connects the, the uh, reconnect the vegetation and the ecology. And that's the site. And so the red lines indicate the ideal connectivity. And this, the master plan you can see in the right hand side, you can see the series of you know, um, built um, fingers that goes out, and then a series of uh, vegetation comes out in between. And this is what it looks like in close up. You can see the vegetation and an area view of the development. You can see that we have to bring the roads across the site as well. And so the road then becomes. Uh, and, uh, an eco undercroft because the vegetation cannot go on top. We go underneath the roads, you know, all the way up to the top of the, of the site. But the edges of this are extremely important because when you match the edges of the vegetation with the built system, um, it's all right if you have a geometrical shape, but ideally you need to make it irregular so that the interaction becomes greater, and ideally so you have something as, as, as um, curvaceous as the one that you see on the right-hand side. And so with this scheme, you can see that uh, the vegetation strip in, in the middle and the, uh, and the built-up finger, and you can see irregular shapes you know, between one and the other to try and enhance the uh, connectivity between the two. And that's the view looking down from the, from the hill into the waterfront. So um, I wanted to find a system for eco-design. And one of the things that we learned is the DNA um, uh, pattern that developed by Francis, Francis Crick and James Watson, where although DNA um, relationship is complex, they, reduce, he, they were able to reduce it down to four simple factors. So I thought, well, that's an idea. Why couldn't I reduce ecological design, even though it's very complex, into a series of factors? And so the first factor to me is nature, which I mentioned earlier on, because nature is the context. It's the background for everything we, that we do. And we have to understand the climate, the ecological systems, the flora and fauna, natural sources, and physical environment before we put anything upon it. Because once we destroy it, we, de we, 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 we clear the land, we lost the vegetation forever, we lost this, the top source. So it take hundreds of years to, to, um, to, to generate. And so we have to understand nature before we put anything upon it. Next is water, as I mentioned. We have to harvest the rainwater. We have to look into waterways so they're not polluted and look into the groundwater and the dew in the lakes. Then there's us as human beings, our activities, our industries, our commerce, our agricultural lifestyles. Now, this is such a big question because we have to change. 
we cannot live the life we're living now. We cannot move about the way we're doing now. And, and our whole view towards economics and consumerism, you know, I mean, you know, how many pairs of shoes do you need? I only have two pairs of shoes and four shirts. But, you, you know, there are people with thousands of pairs of shoes and lots of clothing. We don't need all that. And so we have to change, and then we have to change the way we eat, the way we move, and our recreation facilities. Then our built environment has to change that I have, you know, that I have mentioned earlier on. So green design is how to bring all this together into a seamless and benign whole. And that is the biggest challenge confronting us as designers today. And if you like, this is the agenda of my, my life's agenda. Now we discuss nature, then we discuss water, and then um, I've just you know, listed down these. I, I color code them. I call nature's utilities green, I call eco-technology gray, and water management is blue, and our behavioral patterns is red. Red because it's the color of blood. And these are things we need to consider and rethink. And so green design isn't as simple as what people think it is. It's, it's a complex uh, set of activities and uh, processes that we have to go through. As Kermit the Frog in Sesame Street says, it's not easy being green. So that's the master plan. So we bring all these together, and then this becomes the basis for designing what I call the ecological city or the ecological um, of an environment. Now, I'm going through then to the next stage just to see how we can look at the built environment. I'm looking at energy, because energy systems is crucial to, us, to, to, our, to our lives today, because without energy, you wouldn't have an air conditioned room. And so um, this is what I call NZEB, which is net zero energy design. And if you look at this simple um, diagram, the red line, the red dotted line represents outside conditions in the temperate climate. You have a jolly cold winter and a very hot summer, you know, and summer it really superheats sometimes. And the blue line represents what engineering has given us, the use of you know, fossil fuels we are able to have a more or less consistent temperature for the whole year. So our comfort levels is based on this. Now what happens if we, are, we except being a little bit cold in winter, a little bit hot in summer, and we have warmer clothes. And so designing the net zero energy building is this process where we go from, um, go from looking at extended environment, we design passive mode systems, mixed mode systems to active mode systems, and eventually productive mode means the use of new resources so that the energy becomes as close in terms of comfort levels to what it is in that blue line without the use of fossil fuels. And that is the ideal. And not that many buildings have been done in this way at the moment, but that is part of what we do in our work. And if you look at nature, if you're trying to imitate nature, nature has the most increasing uh, efficiency and that's something that we need to do. And this is the, the process we go from conventional design down to carbon zero, which is to go from passive mode. That means, passive mode means improve comfort conditions without the use of any engineering systems. Maximum mode means some engineering systems like use of ceiling fans and exhaust ducts. Full mode means the present, you know, like this building that we're in, where we have to make sure it's clean technology and it is the most efficient systems we can use. And productive mode is where we excuse me, I have to use a renewable source of energy. So passive mode means, you know, the techniques in passive mode, we have to respond to the climate location to, to, to achieve passive mode. And these are some of the targets we try to achieve in our design. So designing a low energy building starts for me with reducing the need for mechanical electric systems, improve conditions without any engineering systems. And so we look at climate, and we need to design with the climate rather than work against the climate. That means the proper orientation of the building, the proper shaping of the building, and the proper um, use of facades and so forth. That's the scheme that we designed, a very early project we did in Kuala Lumpur. And Kuala Lumpur, as you know, is about 2.9 degrees above the equator. That's the solar path. That's the first thing we look at. And so here's a scheme where we had two roofs. We had a, a flat roof and then a louver roof on top. And in many ways, the roof of roofs, like umbrella, I call this umbrella architecture because umbrella is an incredibly useful device. It keeps out of rain, keeps out of sun, and it's fairly flexible. And so the umbrella in this case, in this situation, is the roof of umbrella. And you can, it lets in the morning sun, keeps out the afternoon and midday sun, and lets it rain through 
to have as a rainwater, and that's the view of the building. And then the pool is used as, uh, as an evaporative cooling device so that the air, that, the wind that goes into the house is cooled by the pool before it enters the house. And the house is designed in such a way that it is perforated, it is, you know, you can get let natural ventilation through at any point in time, uh, through across the house, there's a staircase going up the top of the building, up to the upper floor. And then we have side walls, which are called wing walls, that re deflects the wind back into the house, and that's the central corridor through the house, and the house is designed in such a way the walls are angled to the outside so that there is a blurring of the relationship between inside and outside. So the house is not like an island on a plot, but actually it's integrated with the plot so that we get the building and the land becomes a series of courtyards, A, B, C, and D, and so that you know, every part of the, of the land becomes usable. That's the edge of the house, that's the view, and that's, um, that's comfort mode, that's, oh, sorry, passive mode. And this project we designed in the UK is in latitude 51 degrees. It's our extension to the Great Children, Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, which is in Guildford Street. And this is the part of the building that we designed. And what we did with this building uh, for the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital is to put a flue wall. Because in the UK, in the, in the, um, in the uh, temperate zone, there's a certain buoyancy between the outside and, out, and the inside. And so that during the mid-seasons, which is spring and autumn, um, the, uh, by putting a, an exhaust opening at the top of the building, it sucks the air from the, from the lower parts of the building up to the top. And so the lower floors, which is uh, operated by, by, by Disney, then it sucks up so that during the mid-seasons, we don't have to, uh, vent, to heat or cool it. And we actually extend the mid-season a little bit in the winter, a little bit in the summer, to reduce the need for heating in winter. That's the view of the building, and that's the exhaust hood. And um, this is, uh, for the Solaris scheme in Singapore, um, it, the ground floor and the atrium is mixed mode, so it is, has no air conditioning and, and uses just some um, uh, cooling air which is blown through it. On top of the building is an atrium with an operable glass louvers, and you can see that most of the time it is open. In the event of inclement weather, it automatically closes. And then we, we did the same thing with the side walls. We designed, we invented what we call a rain check wall. And you can see the wall is actually not straight. It's a ziggurat form. But in fact, it, you know, it is a series of sawtooth um, shapes. So you can see the, the inclined, the, the angled panel is glass. And you can see through it. Then on top of it, I have perforated metal. So it lets the wind through and gives up the rain. I call this a rain check wall. And we had to. Uh, uh, do CFD, computerized fluid dynamics analysis of it, make sure it works, and this is what it looks like in the close-up, you know, the, uh, the rain check wall. And that's the simulation of the comfort conditions in the atrium above. Now, humans, as I mentioned, have to change. Uh, my friend Alan talks about salutogenic um, aspects of human society, increasing the human welfare and, 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 and uh, through, um, by design, we have to change. Now, a significant amount of energy is used by human beings in, in moving about. In fact, the, the biggest use of energy in, in private cars is not going to work, not taking the children to school, but actually for little, little, little trips that we make to our neighbors, to the pub, to the doctors, um, to the provision shop. And so what we try to do with the project in Reunion is design what we call um, walkable communities. But at the end of the day, when we talk about sustainable design, it starts with us as human beings. We have to change. Because our human welfare is related to our material standard of living, which depends on provision of manufactured goods, enclosures, and build structures, which in turn requires consumption of natural resources, which then means extraction of natural resources and devastation ecosystems, which involves extraction of waste into the environment, which then results in environmental pollution. So this is, this is like the sequence of what we're doing to the environment, which leads to unsustainable future. So we have to change. Uh, we have to have an anti-consumerist um, attitude towards life, our diets have to change, mobility, modality, 
lifestyle, industrial and commercial system change. But this is the big question. We are just designers, we're not immensely powerful people, so um, it requires commitment of governments, commitment of, of, of businesses to make this work. And so we're only touching the tip of it. And so for this scheme, we try and design it with a seven-minute walking distance so that the shops are within the proximity of seven minutes of each community. So we don't use cars, you know, we just walk, because seven minutes is about as much as you know, most people can walk, you know, especially at my, at my age, and that uh, you know, to the doctors, to the pubs, to the cafe, to the restaurants, and to the hospitals and shops. And then this is combined with the mass transit system so that people can walk from one community to another community. So in this way, you head towards increasingly low entry building. Now, um, part of our work is what we call biomimicry, which is imitating the properties, the ecosystems. And if you like, you know, this, this uh, table is my, my life's agenda, trying to find ways in which you can imitate nature um, so that we, we, we have a greater level of biointegration. Today, I've just covered some of the factors you can see on the top and the ones that I've not covered at the bottom. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, before uh, um, Dr. Yang leaves the stage, I think we'll take a few uh, questions. Okay, can somebody take a chair to the, up to the stage? Okay, uh, thank you very much for um, Dr. Yang's very insightful talk. Um, I think um, a lot of people think that um, urban development and the conservation of natural ecosystem are always fighting against each other. But I think uh, Dr. Yang has demonstrated to us that it is not always the case. Um, actually, the two can work together hand in hand, provided that we um, take the um, right approach, okay, uh, adopt a very sensitive um, design approach, then we can actually, urban development can contribute positively to the natural ecosystem. Okay, now, um, this has come to the Q&A time, so any question from the floor? Okay. Uh, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Yang, uh, my, name, uh, my, name is, uh, my name is Wilson, and, <coughs> uh, and I come from Hong, Hong Kong. Uh, I, think, uh, I think your projects and, and, uh, and your speech is very, is very inspiring and, uh, and, also is very, and also is very touching. And I just wish to have two very small questions for uh, for uh, for one of your project i uh, i think is in uh, is in malaysia you uh, you uh, you have met, uh, you have mentioned is that the uh, the orientate the orientations of the uh, of the lift lobby and the and the and the orientation of the of of the office tower of the office tower itself is uh, is different i thought the orientation of the office tower I guess it's uh, is facing north, is it? And uh, and uh, and I just wish to know uh, what like uh, what exactly is the uh, is the, the uh, is the is the eco is the is the eco design uh, theme re uh, regarding the difference in the in the orientations of the lift lobby and uh, and and in what direction exactly is the is the lift lobby is. Uh, fa is facing at, um, and my second question is regarding the eco design. I, I, uh, I, uh, I, I think you have used a lot of green, uh, green, uh, greening, green roof, and vertical greening, and water feet and water features in uh, in your eco design for architecture, and and I think it's very inspiring. But in uh, but in some part of the cities in uh, in uh, say in UK in Hong Kong and some of the west and some of the Western worlds, they uh, they seem they seem to use a lot of the activity. Of the active design, say, uh, say the bi, say the bi pan, 
BIPB pan, uh, panels, etc., which is uh, which it, which seem which seems to look very high tech to achieve the uh, the uh, the vision of sustainability. And uh, and I just wish to know the uh, the views of uh, of uh, of Dr. Yan re uh, regarding that sort of approach. That's a lot of questions. Hello? Who oh, can't hear me? Well, I'll pay to answer one, so I'll answer one. No, so I'm joking, i answer two. Um, the first question is to do with um, what are called design of climate, which is passive mode design. With passive mode design, you start to look at the seasons of the year, and you look at the sun path. In the tropics, the sun is mostly east and west. A third of the day on the east side, a third of the day above, and a third of the day more or less on the, on, on the west side. And so the objective is to keep out the sun in the midday in the, in, in, the, uh, in the late afternoon. Whereas in the temperate zone, you want to let the sun in during the winter months and keep out the sun in the, in the summer months. So you know, there are differences in different climatic zones that you have to respond to. And so the shape of the building is important because you know, if, you, if this is north, now you have a shape of the building which is, you know, which is, let's say, diagonal to north. Then all four facades of the building gets um, gets solar insulation, solar radiation. So uh, ideal sh orientation building is to have exactly north south, but that's not always possible. So orientation is important. The next is the building configuration. Now, if the building is this shape, rectangular, uh, you know, uh, squarish, as against a rectangular. Then if it's rectangular, then you find that the narrow, the small size of the rectangle on the east and west sides get less sun than north and south because in the tropics you don't get too much sun from, from, you know, from the north and south, except for certain times of the year. Whereas in the temperate zone, it's the other way around. And so the shaping of the building is orientation, is facade design, is use of wind and, 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 other, and, and use of the ambient energies are very important in, in climate responsive design because you need to optimize it before you put in any engineering systems. Now, if you don't optimize this, then you start with a building which is wrongly configured, wrongly orientated, so that when you put engineering systems, you have to correct, correct it. You have to have some greater engineering systems to compensate for this, which then makes total nonsense of designing a low energy building. And so with uh, climate res responsive design, or, or bioclimatic design or pesco mode design, these are different terms for the same thing. Um, understanding the climate of locality and its meteorological patterns is extremely important. So the next thing is you ask about vegetation and with, um, uh, with photovoltaics. These are two separate things altogether. Vegetation, is, you know, is to, is the objective is to enhance the biodiversity of the land that has been devastated by human beings. As I mentioned, human beings, when you go on any piece of land, the first thing to do is you know, clear, clear, clear the vegetation, scrape all the you know, valuable topsoil, and then they plonk whatever it is there, and then they put impervious surfaces. Once you put impervious surfaces, the rainwater then goes onto the drains, goes on the drains, goes to rivers, and it's gone forever. So what you need to do is to, is to have vegetation, have habitats, and have biosphere to bring the water back to recharge the groundwater rather than let it go somewhere else. And so that, 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 is, uh, that is why we put veg you know, uh, vegetation, why we put, uh, bring back um, organic matters into the site. Now photovoltaics is something altogether. Photovoltaics you know, tries to collect energy from the sun. You know, 20, 30 years ago when I first started, photovoltaics had an efficiency of about 6%, 7%. But with super photovoltaics today, we can achieve 15%, 17%. But we still haven't got you know, 80%, 90% yet. So, so photovoltaics is still not a truly efficient way of collecting energy. But what we need to do is to try and invent something that imitates nature, which is to, if we can imitate photosynthesis, because that's how nature collects energy. The only source of energy from any ecological system is from the sun. And from the sun, it is through the photo, through the process of, mostly through the process of photosynthesis. And this is, this, is, this is something that we still haven't been able to invent. How we can imitate photosynthesis. And so these are the two aspects you know, to answer your question. One and two, first with, you know, you know, uh, with orientation buildings and designing with climate. And the second is the difference between putting vegetation buildings and photovoltaics. So I hope I answered both your questions.
Okay, so uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Yang, for a very detailed answer to the crew questions. So, uh, any more questions from the floor? Okay. Um, Dr. Yang, thank you very much. Um, very inspiring, as always. Um, my name is Adam Robarts from Robarts Spaces in Beijing. Um, you said that uh, we must change. And um, when I'm sitting in a knowledge community like this, I feel that we have plenty of knowledge. You know, the internet provides an abundance of data, of knowledge that is there. But yet we're not making the changes that we need to make um, at the scale and at the speed we need. Um, why, in your opinion, is there an, a, a paralysis of will? And where is that going to come from in terms of a will to act um, to make that change? Uh, well, in some ways, I'm fairly optimistic. In some ways, I'm not so. Um, I've been working in this field of sustainable design since 1971. That's nearly 40 years ago. 45 years ago, and um, in those days, I was regarded as a hippie, you know, long haired and living in the commune and things like that. And so, um, to, but something happened about 10, 15 years ago. A lot of people jumped up and said, we have to do something about environment. And so with the Kyoto you know, meeting and different meetings, countries are now starting to look into um, sustainable design. Like in China, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of token gestures, but it hasn't really been implemented. Right now, I'm working on a project in Chengdu, and I'm trying to make this into a green design. But trying to convince, you know, the authorities to do that, you know, means you have to put a little bit of extra bit of dosh into it, a little bit of extra money to make it green. And so, um, so trying to convince authorities to do that is a big issue. And we can't change, we're not powerful enough to do this. This has to come top down from politics, from politicians. And I think, you know, um, to effect change, you know, politicians have to do a number of things. It's a bit like bringing up children. You know, you, you, the first way to get people to change is through incentives. You know, you tell a child, you know, if you do this and this and this, you get you sort of carve the weekend, or you get some extra pocket money, or you get ice cream. So incentives are something the government can do to effect change. So you do this and this, you pay less tax, or you get, you know, uh, you know whatever, your license is extra quick, or whatever. So the first thing the government must do to effect change to a sustainable future is to devise incentives. The second way to get children to, to behave is through penalty. If you don't do this, you get smacked, or you, you, know, you don't get any pocket money, or you're grounded. You know? And so, the same thing with government. If you, if you pollute the environment, or you don't do this and this, you don't save energy, then we're going to increase your tax, or we're going to stop your factory, you stop your businesses. So that's the second way of, uh, of affecting change. The third way to get children to do what you want to do is through love and affection, and education. You say, do this, you know, mommy and daddy will love you more, or whatever. And so, in the same way, the government has to educate people. Tell them that you know, by doing this, you know, it enables a resilient future. And so these are three ways, through penalty, through incentives, and through education and persuasion. And so, but it has to come from top down. Extremely difficult for, for you know, a little guy like me you know, telling government what to do. You know. None of us can, you know, unless we become politicians ourselves, which actually a lot of my architect friends have become. Uh, so, I hope that answers your question about um, why isn't it happening. I don't think it's to do with knowledge. You're talking about you know, rumors, pots of knowledge. It's to do with us. I mean, for instance, our diets have to change. I was in Japan the other day and a dietitian told me that 20% uh, of climate change comes from eating beef. I said, what do you mean? He said, we have to clear the land, remove the you know, vegetation you know, to rear the beef, we have to feed beef with corn, which is then we have to clear the land somewhere else to grow the corn to feed the beef. And then slaughtering the beef itself gives our gas into the environment. 
And so, you know, that doesn't mean that, you know, we should all become vegetarian. We should eat fish and eat equivalent, eat nuts or whatever. But we should stop eating as much beef as possible because that contributes towards climate change. So our diets have to change. But I mean, you can convince, you know, I'm, almost, I'm, I'm pretty well sure, you know, there are very few people in, in this room who are vegetarian. Uh, um, and so to tell, you know, you know the, the 200 people in the room to, to stop eating beef when you leap out of this room, you know, it's, you know, it's going to be extremely difficult. If you have to sign a little charter outside before they leave the room. Uh, <laughs> and so um, it's a big question. I don't know how to do this. We have to start from schools. So for instance, at schools, you should start teaching ecology from kindergarten. You know, that be kind to the environment, to a good environment, and things we have to do. But because I'm only a designer, I can look at it from the architect's point of view, from the design point of view. I don't know, I haven't done, got enough time to do research in human society and our lifestyles and find ways to change, which maybe I should do some point in time. But as you can see, I have, you know, I have a whole host of things to do and might achieve all this within my lifetime, but um, this is some things you have to do. But it's a very good point. We have to change. Okay. I think uh, change is not always easy, but uh, I think uh, all the sector of the community we need to work together. And, but actually, I think uh, in the past two or three decades, I think it has been changing gradually, okay. Um, so any more questions from the floor? So, uh, okay, the lady over there. I'm, I'm struck by the evolution of the work that you've shown, and second, by the complexity of the, um, the infrastructure that you were describing. Can you share with me how you measure the success of any given project at the end? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, and how to quantify it, how to quantify the success? Some of our buildings, um, the owners have done what you call post-occupancy evaluation. You know, how, how the people who use this the building feel about the building and how the use of the building feel about the, uh, how the use visitors to the building feel about it. So, um, so I, get a, you know, I get an indication of, of how successful I have been in my design. There are other factors such as, you know, the percentage of water we can save. And, and for instance, you know, building in Singapore, um, we, the, uh, the energy and water savings contribute to um, nearly 70 cents a square foot. And so green design actually is justifiable, but the cost of green design, um, we usually ask uh, for an average building to, to budget between four to, four to eight percent premium over the, the industry standard of construction cost for that particular building type. And so um, once you budget between that amount, then you know you have a certain amount of budget, you know, money to play with. And we did the building in Singapore, we got green mark platinum, which is the highest rating system you can get in Singapore, at 6.3%. And so the amount of money you spend, you know, on, 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 on making it super green, and the amount of savings you get is uh, additional criteria. With vegetation, one of the things we try to do is, is to measure biodiversity before and after. So these are some, of, you know, this is looking at biodiversity factors. And so different criteria for doing this. So there are ways to, to, to measure it. Um, but of course, at the end of the day, somebody has to pay for it. It's extremely difficult to get a client to pay for it, you know. Get a client to pay for green design is sort of difficult enough. And trying to get the design approved, you know, is difficult enough. You know, they say that an architect has, first of all, he's got to fight to get the job. Having, having fought for the job, he'll fight to get the design approved by the client. Having got the design fight to be approved by the client, he has to fight with, with the authorities to get it approved. Having got it with the authorities, he's got to fight with the contractor to build it the way that he wants. And if you have to fight with the users so they can use it the way that you think they should use the building. That explains how immensely tired I am. So um, I hope that answers your question. Okay, maybe we can have time for one more question. Any more question? Oh dear. Any more? Okay. Ah, yes, ma'am. Lady over there. Okay. 
So you can say no to this question or not answer it because it's personal given what you've just said and I guess given the question here around what can drive change, I'm interested in where your passion for what you do comes from. Something's inspired you from many years ago and helped you achieve all the things that you've achieved. I wonder where that inspiration and that passion has come from. Oh. And as I said, you don't have to answer. A but I'm intrigued. A personal question. Could be worse. Uh, no, uh, I'm not sure. Um, well, it started about back in '69, I think, about 20, 30, 40 years ago, when I thought architecture was just a walk in the park. And um, I finished architecture after my third year. Architecture since was four years. And um, after my third year, I said, Yes, I walk in the park. I can pass my fifth exam you know, straight away. So I went back to school and I said, I'm going to take all my first fifth exams on the first of my fourth year. And the school said, can't be done. Nobody's done it before. Nobody passed five years in three and three and a quarter years. But anyway, I did it. And uh, actually, that was the winter of discontent in the UK because you know, there was a power strike and I had to draft you know, with candlelight on each side of my T-square because it didn't have computers in those, in those days. My mum was making coffee for me, but I passed. So the, the school said, oh dear, you have one and a half years of local authority craft from Camden, what are you going to do with it? And so at that time I met uh, you know, my provident uh, professor at, um, at a bar, and I said, I'm starting a research group to work on the Autonomous House Project. The Autonomous House Project is a project mooted by the uh, the U.S. Uh, engineer and visionary Buckminster Fuller, which is for a house which is disconnected from the city's utilities, that's able to function without, you know, connecting to the water supply, without the energy supply, which is used as well of the city, and if it could have its own food supply as well. So it was an interesting project. They got a science research council grant at that time to, to work into it. So I joined this unit. Now after six months in the project, I decided. Well, actually, the real issue is about sustainable design. And so I said, look, you know, John, I really can't do this, and if you don't mind, I'll, I'd like to do a PhD on sustainable design. And so I did a PhD on sustainable design, and uh, when I finished it, it became my life's agenda. So that's how it came about. And uh, so I started with vegetation in buildings, an idea that grows on you. Um, so, uh, that's what I've been doing since I started practice, since 1975. A lot of people say that, you know, because I come from Malaysia, you know, that's a land of verdant vegetation, you know, that explains my interest in ecology and in landscape. But no, it's because of, of the research work. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's joining us talking to you, and uh, I hope um, to some extent it, you, it will have an impact on you, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Yang once more for his very wonderful and very insightful speech today. Thank you.